Well, the idea started uh, with uh, my research on the literature mm -hmm. in migration studies, and um, um, a big emphasis has been made on an inward-looking perspective on migration. Uh, so we're talking about uh, integration of migrants, we're talking about you know, the whole utilitarian discourse of what migrants will bring to us, but also the uh, what kind of insecurity they will bring, what kind of problems we'll have to solve as they come into the, uh, the reception countries. Uh, but often the perspective of migrants themselves, their own outlook on, on their mobility and on the, the migratory process is lost. So what makes the decision to migrate take place? And there's a whole decision-making process that includes preparation, uh, anticipation, discussing with others what happens when you undertake a journey. Uh, so this decision-making process is very complex, but it also, but it is also collective. The aspirations for these migrants is quite mundane, quite banal. They just want normalcy. They want to transpose whatever they lost or they think they have lost in the in the reception country. And the trigger is not necessarily an event, precisely like my house got burned or uh, I lost this relative, or, but it's more of a feeling, and this feeling of becomes more and more overwhelming that I cannot continue here. It is not sustainable. Interesting, because I also interviewed people who have fled through Lebanon, so they left Syria, and they went to the, you know, the closest possibility, which is Lebanon, Jordan, or Turkey, actually. A lot of them went to Turkey. Um, and some of those who left, say, Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan to come to Germany, they have the same kind of of idea because a lot of them said well maybe I'll try my luck in Turkey because you know Turkey is close culturally a Muslim country uh, I can come back visit families I'm close to the relatives who stay behind um, uh, but again the same the same ha the same thing happens is that well there is it is not sustainable to live in a country like Turkey where you do not have a legal status uh, where rent is too expensive uh, you work in um, in the informal sector. The trigger is not only searching for safety, but also searching for uh, uh, restoring a lost life or lost uh, uh, way of life. The migratory process itself is violent, and I'm not talking only about physical violence. There is structural violence. There is epistemic violence, uh, and this violence pervades the whole migratory journey. Uh, and the migratory journey. Um, uh, includes also the arrival in the reception country, the country where they chose to request asylum. And this is also, uh, there is also violent experiences in that situation. In the home country, say in Syria for instance, it's not so much the imminent violence that, that is threatening. Um, you know, they don't expect all of a sudden that militias will come, storm into their houses and just start shooting. That's not what really happens. It's more of an atmosphere of violence that it's always there. It's kind of heavy. However, there are there are uh, instances during the journey of imminent violence, meaning that while you are crossing the a body of sea, you don't know if you're going to drown or not. Uh, you don't know if the coast guards will catch you or not, and you'll have to flee. But you also have violence that is exerted by smugglers. Uh, in France, for instance, there is this phenomenon of uh, a lot of unaccompanied children okay. that are do not have a legal status and a lot of them spend a lot of nights in the streets uh, and of course we know what that brings I mean it's it can mark a person forever uh, you also have ignoring the, the ignorance of, of trauma of a lot of uh, migrants who have experienced very uh, uh, disastrous ex uh, events in their lives yes so and of course you have the structural violence that exists also in the arrival country which is the difficulties of socioeconomic insertion, finding a job or uh, resuming education, finding decent housing. We cannot reduce violence to one aspect, which is physical violence, because then we think that providing camps uh, is a solution, but of course it's, it's not. So violence is not necessarily, well, a shipwreck, and you see the images, which is spectacular, and, and it exists, we cannot deny it, but there is the, the more insidious violence. Uh, we cannot just reduce migrants to are they a resource or their solution to demographic issues, to the labor market? Will they bring skilled workers? Uh, we cannot just look at that and say, well, then we will accept migrants. Because as soon as you do that, you start establishing a hierarchy between migrants, which is very unfair. Especially when, when, when asylum seekers are trying to convince the asylum officer of their presence. 
that is the country of presumption of innocence. You start like, well, you have to prove your good faith and your goodwill so that you become legitimate. So this is very <coughs> problematic. Asylum seekers do not have to prove that they are victims of persecution, but they have to substantiate it, right? They have to provide enough documents to substantiate it. This is what the law says. Uh, but of course, the difference between substantiating something and proving something is very thin, and it's up to the subjectivity um, of the asylum officer. And this is where it becomes problematic, and this is where we have to be able to broaden a little bit our perspective on, 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 on migration. Uh, basically, the whole idea of uh, this clear dichotomy between, you know, violence and safety, well, it's not, it's not there. Uh, and also, uh, a complete disinterest in what happens between departure and arrival. Provision of protection does not start at the reception, but much earlier. And in fact, throughout the migratory proce process, there has to be a provision of protection. Protection has to be done in cooperation with non-state actors, non-governmental uh, non NGOs.